Good evening, everyone. I'm Chie Ida. I'm the events coordinator for the Seattle Japanese Garden. Thank you for attending our Kaleidoscope virtual event, Art of Sumi with Midori Kono Fio. We're very fortunate to have the support of the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership as a sponsor for this virtual series, including tonight's event. Midori is a Seattle-based calligrapher, printmaker, performer of Japanese traditional arts, including koto and shamisen. She has also worked as an educator for public schools and universities in and around Seattle and taught dozens of workshops while exhibiting around the United States and Japan. Tonight, Midori will be introducing us to the basics of Japanese calligraphy and sumi. We hope you enjoy our presentation and stay for a live Q&A after the presentation. I'm Midori Kono Theo, and I'm a, a calligraphy artist and sumi artist. We're having a series of, of demonstrations at the Japanese Garden, and I'm doing one on uh, calligraphy, Japanese and Chinese calligraphy, and also sumi painting, uh, in which we use the brushes. I'm holding several brushes here, uh, which I usually don't use. I use the small one, but not the big one for painting. But I thought you might be interested in seeing that, that this is also part of, of the equipment that um, we carry around. Um, so I'm, I'll be doing some uh, demonstration of Japanese and Chinese calligraphy and, and uh, explain how it came to be and what is the significance of the calligraphy is in not only uh, ja Japan, but China and, and Korea. Those three countries are uh, very have very important calligraphy uh, studies. Japanese calligraphy comes uh, developed from uh, from the calligraphy of China. Uh, China is much much older, several thousand years older than Japan, and so the calligraphy in China had developed about 5,000 BC, and it had developed um, on the lines of of picture writing. And we still use that particular uh, picture writing, uh, which is the seal script writing. And it's used in particular um, to, to design the seals of uh, people uh, when, when they finish with their work, they usually use, they usually press the seal, which is their signature. And this is a practice that has gone on for thousands of years. The um, Japanese calligraphy developed in particular around um, 500 AD. And in about 800 AD, uh, Kukai, the monk, uh, decided to go to China. And he and his friend, went to China, I think Kukai went for eight years, studying Buddhism and also uh, studying calligraphy. And he and his friend gathered many of the materials which they brought back to, to Japan and became, became part of the uh, imperial collection. And in fact, a, a lot of the calligraphy which uh, was, was brought back to Japan is still in existence and um, a lot of it was destroyed in China. So Japan has been a kind of repository of uh, calligraphy. Now, what I'm doing right now is um, making the ink and 
the Chinese are actually they are so very clever. They uh, develop so many of these unusual um, ways of, of treating writing. This particular uh, block of it looks like a block of stone, but what it is is uh, um, an inkstone. It's it's made of of um, ink which has been uh, the smoke has been gathered on the walls of a smoke room, and then they knead it until they they can uh, make this ink stone and you can you can um, use this ink for decades it's it's a fantastic way of carrying ink instead of a bottle of ink uh, it, you uh, you carry just this stick and then you rub it in the water in this ink stone, which is often very beautiful. And, and you keep rubbing until it's dark. Now let's, I think what I'm going to do is check it to make sure that it's, to see whether it's uh, re ready. And I'll take one of my, Maybe I should take this one. We usually brush, um, we usually wet, wet the brush first so that it receives the ink. And then we dip it into the Ink well. This is called the ocean of the stone, and this is like a beach. What I'm going to do right now is is write the uh, basic strokes of calligraphy. These are uh, very basic strokes, and you can you can um, practice them over and over. You can practice them a hundred or a thousand times, and each time your brush stroke will get better. So these strokes have no meaning, but they're, um, they're used to perfect your stroke. So, let's see. You press and you pull. Press and you pull. And you have a long stroke. You press down. You pull. And another stroke. Press down. So what you want to do is, is perfect each stroke. And this is this is the these are the basic strokes. Oops. The wind wants to go one way. And what I'm going to do now is uh, use these basic strokes to make a character. And, and this is a, uh, an exercise that the Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans have used for hundreds and thousands of years. And it, apparently, if you use this one, these uh, basic strokes and you um, write this particular character, you will become a famous, a great calligrapher. So it's, it's very, looks very simple.
some of these strokes are joined together and others are separate. So this is the uh, basic strokes, and it makes the character for A. And A is the first character of um, of the, the word for eternity or infinity. It's really a beautiful, beautiful character. So you, I never get tired of, of writing it. But this is a very difficult character. It's it's really uh, a very advanced character. So you really don't, even though you get it in the very beginning, um, you can keep on writing until, well, in infinity, probably. Now I'm going to refer, uh, refer to some simpler characters, and these are very, very simple ones, which um, were more picture writing. And then they got very simple. To, this is um, a picture of a mountain. Whoops. These are two uh, characters. One is mountain, so there's a picture of a mountain, and the other is a river. Uh, the river is, is um, delineated by just three strokes. And I thought, especially since we're in the garden, and um, surrounded by nature, it would be fitting to use some nature symbols as part of our calligraphy. These are two characters. One is for flower. This is flower, or uh, ohana, ohana. And this one is bamboo, take. Then I'm doing um, the word for water. If you 
look at this, the water symbol is very simil similar to the character for um, oops, the character for e e eternity or infinity, and it's it's because the the character is uh, depicts not only something basic about um, the character in nature, but it has a more abstract uh, meaning. Uh, infinity meaning time that goes endlessly. And so uh, part of infinity has the word for water. Uh, these are all very simple characters. And the last one here is the word for, for tree. So all of these, um, bamboo, uh, flower, Water and tree are uh, manifestations of the nature which is surrounding us in this beautiful garden. Now, I was asked to talk a little bit about how I got into calligraphy. Uh, I'm actually a painter, and um, I was in Berkeley uh, studying uh, abstract uh, painting, and I became very um, enamored with the work of Franz Klein. And he seemed to, it was very abstract, but it also seemed to have some kind of relationship to the abstractness that you see find in uh, calligraphy. And so simultaneously, I became interested in, in calligraphy. And when we went to Japan, uh, I found out there's an adult education class in the town of Kamakura where we were living. So I started taking lessons there. And that was 30, 40 years ago, I think. <laughs> And when I came back to, to uh, the United States, we settled in Seattle. And I found, about a year later, I found out that there was a group that had formed here. And it's called Beikok Shodo Kenkikai. And I joined it in 1978. And I'm still a member there. We, and we, um, we do very basic calligraphy and also calligraphy, um, which are abstractions. Um, and we sent to Japan for exhibit and, and a number of our group have uh, won prizes. And so we're still going on and um, we're constantly joined by new people who are uh, interested in calligraphy. Uh, it's, it's a discipline that's it takes a lot of your time, and um, a lot of people drop out on the way. Well, I, and I think I've dropped out a couple of times, but always came went back to calligraphy. Uh, let's see. I have to check and see. Oh, I was going to also do some sumi painting. I don't know how much time we have, but um, sumi painting and calligraphy are very much related. The, the characters here are flower, water, tree, and so um, you can also use, use the same brush and the same uh, 
a lot of times the same characters and, and try to, um, instead of doing the calligraphy, you can do the uh, paintings of, of these beautiful trees around us. Uh, the, the strokes are very similar. And so, for instance, we did, uh, we did Mountain, which was pretty abstract. It's just three characters. But it can, you can use your brush in a very free, much freer way uh, with uh, calligraphy. Um, with uh, sumi painting and for instance tree tree is much more formal in when it's done, done as a character but we can use the same kind of strokes So instead of instead of the character, we now have the tree. This. Both study of both sumi painting and calligraphy, calligraphy are, it can be endless. There's no end to it. And um, so you never run out of things to do. There are many different ways to use the brush in calligraphy, both calligraphy and sumi painting. And here, I've used what's called um, um, kasure, which is the scumbling of the brush. So it's it's the stroke looks very rough, and you can do that with calligraphy too. You can have the calligraphy strokes very smooth and or else you can have them written with a br rough brush stroke. Maybe five more minutes. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to have a question and answer period uh, as part of the um, uh, a later uh, program. So if you have any questions, you can 
I'll save up your questions then. kinds of dots and dashes. So I think we'll bring it to a close, and I hope um, you've uh, learned a little bit more about calligraphy and sumi and the culture of Japan and China. And check with the uh, with the Japanese garden for their other programs too. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another evening of our Kaleidoscope virtual series, The Art of Sumi. I'm Chie Iga, I'm the events coordinator for the Seattle Japanese Garden. Tonight, we have Midori Kono Hio with us for a live Q&A. Uh, Midori, would you like to turn your video on and unmute? And There you are. Hi, Midori. Hi. Thank you for joining us tonight and for introducing us to one of your many talents. Are you ready to answer some questions from the audience? Yes, I'd love to. Okay, let's get started. So please type in your questions in the Q&A box down below um, next to the chat. So make sure you type in in Q&A, not the chat. And let's see if we have any questions. There is a good one. Okay, Midori, first question. With Sumi painting, does each artist represent trees the same way? Or does, does each artist have a different interpretation? Uh, that's the freedom of um, Sumi painting. You can um, interpret it the way you want to. Uh, there's a basic pattern that you learn, but um, from the basic patterns, then you can go off on your own. Okay. Is there a name for the basic pattern? Uh, no. Uh, let's see, I can't really remember it. Um, th there is the basic pattern for for the uh, calligraphy strokes. AG, it's called Eiji Hapo, the eight basic strokes. Um, and I'm sure there's there are, um, names for the different strokes in Sumi, but um, I don't recall them. <laughs> Next question, is black ink the only color used? Uh, the Sumi uh, painting is basically black ink, but, uh, from, but you can um, extrapolate, uh, you can just use the black ink, but you can also um, use color. There are a number of different um, Paint, paints that have been developed uh, for the Sumi painting. Okay, so you can enjoy both. Good. Okay, um, next one. How do you know when your ink is ready? Is it the darkness or texture? Uh, that's a good question. It, it, 
when you prepare your ink, it takes quite a bit of time before it uh, it, it uh, reaches the right texture and and um, uh, basically when it comes when it uh, becomes something like cream there's just a slight uh, heaviness to the the ink then you know that it's correct also you can just um, check it on a, a piece of paper to see if it's the uh, color that you want. Uh, you can use black ink, just really very dense black ink, but you can also um, thin it to the ink so that it's there uh, different shades of gray. And uh, there are two different names, noboku, which means uh, black ink, and tamboku, which means uh, gray ink. So those are the two two essential essential shades that you can extrapolate from. But the dish you use to make the ink is usually black. Uh, mostly black. Um, it's a special kind of stone that you use that they make it from, but. Actually, in uh, China, they've used a number of different stones. They've used jade or jadeite, and um, not only black. Black is basic, but there are different stones that have been used. Um, and, and people collect the, the stones. Um, some, a lot of people, some people, collect the, the ink stones and never use them. <laughs> they just uh, like to look at them, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. How popular is sumi painting in Japan today? Uh, I think there's probably, uh, there's been a, a revival. Um, I think that the Western painting is the most popular among the Japanese, and um, and some people think that the ink painting is a bit old-fashioned. But um, once you start using the ink, uh, it it's very what's the word for it. Anyway, it, it catches your attention. Uh, but I would say Western painting is probably more popular. But there's, there's something about the black ink that um, it, there's a very deep feeling uh, when you use it. And it does really catch your attention. Okay, next question. Um, you didn't talk about loading the brush. Could you explain that process? When uh, you use the black ink, um, you 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 put the uh, brush into the ink and. You just don't um, just wet it a little bit. It it, um, it takes a while for the the ink to reach the fibers of the ink, so that it it w works. And um, so you kind of uh, loading means putting the the brush into the ink and and. Um, I think it's you, you. It's it's more a feeling that you have as you um, you uh, put the the brush into the ink. But you don't just you know put it in once and then it's loaded. A, a lot of people um, 
actually don't don't spend enough time maybe loading their brush and so so it looks a little bit thin when when they put it on the paper but if you load the brush properly uh, there's a richness to the color that's something you learn over time you just know when it's ready uh, yes, I think so. It takes a little bit of experience. Okay, uh, let's see. Do you have a type of paper that you prefer for practice for sumie? Uh, there are a number of different papers, um, uh, both for the calligraphy and for the sumi painting. Uh, for the calligraphy, uh, there's some special um, papers that have um, been uh, developed and a lot of the uh, large papers actually come also from China. Um, when, when you go into calligraphy, you start come getting into different types of paper and and you find that certain papers work better than other papers. So it's a bit of uh, experience, things you learn by experience, but also you have te teachers who've been using papers for a long time and, and you rely on your teacher's experience too. Um, the Sumi painting, there are different um, papers for Sumi painting and some of them are um, those, they call it dosa hiki, which means that there's been a sizing, special sizing put on the paper. And so um, some papers will take the ink and, and the ink will run on it. And that's part of the, the, um, special um, effect that you get from th these papers. And, and the other papers which have the sizing on it uh, are used specially so that the uh, ink or the paint pigments won't run. So it's, it's a matter of um, learning different papers experience. But you can also use uh, Western papers, um, experiment with di different papers. Do you have a place you can recommend to get these supplies? Uh, yes, there's, uh, uh, we're very fortunate that um, in Seattle, we have certain places that we can go for, um, for the papers. Um, the, my calligraphy group, uh, usually gets their papers from a, a wholesaler in Tokyo. And um, our, our president uh, usually orders them. But um, uh, it's a matter of, of what you like to use. Uh, Daniel Smith has a lot of different papers. Um, so you can experiment with what they have. They have both Chinese and Japanese papers. And, uh, and um, there are certain pads of papers which are um, from Japan, uh, which are Hosho and uh, Kozo, uh, two different types of uh, papers that you can use. Actually, if once you get into paper, it could be endless and very expensive. <laughs> but um, y you can you can use you know you can use almost any papers, and a lot of people use um, newsprint um, because it's inexpensive. It's a Western paper, and it has a somewhat of the texture of the um, the native Sumi painting papers. Okay. I think we 
we have just enough time for one more question. So let's see. Thank you everyone for all these great questions. You have a question? Yeah, so last question. Here it is. Can I learn sumi painting from books or would I need to take a, a course? Um, there, there's a lot of material in books and, and you can learn a lot from books. Um, there's certain things that is easiest if you have a teacher. And um, we, we have a number of teachers in the area, uh, both um, Chinese, in Chinese painting and Japanese painting. Um, uh, we also have a, an organization called Puget Sound Sumi Artists, uh, which was founded in Tacoma by uh, Fumi Kimura, who is a uh, wonderful Sumi artist and and she's she and a couple of her uh, friends uh, started the Puget Sound, Sound Puget Sound Sumi artists and um, there are about 70 people in it of uh, all different uh, national nationalities and they are bound together by their love for Sumi painting. And, and they have paint, um, well, before the, uh, the virus thing, um, we had uh, monthly meetings, but, and hope, hopefully we'll be back to that. But um, there are a number of people who are really uh, enthusiasts of, of Sumi painting. And um, there are also a number of uh, Chinese painters from uh, um, uh, China, Beijing. And um, um, I think there's an or organization called um, uh, Chinese Painters Association. Okay. So those are good places to start to look for teachers once the COVID is over. Yeah, a lot of, there are a lot of people who've um, gone to Puget Sound Sumi artists and, and um, taken from one or the other of the teachers there. Um, it's based, primarily based in Tacoma, but uh, there are also people from the, in the Seattle area who belong. That's all the time we have. Um, thank you, Midori, for being here tonight. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And please stay tuned for a brief message from Jean Peterson, one of our many wonderful garden volunteers. Have a good night. Hi, my name is Jean Peterson. I'm a volunteer docent at Seattle Japanese Garden. Thank you for attending this Kaleidoscope webinar on Sumi painting. I hope you enjoyed it. The Kaleidoscope series is created with support from the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership, and recordings of previous webinars are now available on the Garden's YouTube page. You can subscribe to the mailing list on our website to be the first to hear about future programs. If you have enjoyed any of our new virtual content, please consider making a donation to support the Garden. A $15 gift helps us maintain the Garden and continue offering free cultural programming to our community. Thanks so much.